and then all of a sudden with this coronavirus those calls aren't coming in the way they they used to sure. and and now a lot of business owners don't really know what to do right and i think i mean so to to get after the the actual question i, I think that one misnomer would be to think that this is a time that calls for all new you know approaches and all new you know uh you know marketing techniques or marketing strategies um i think tried and true is still is still tried and true i think there's more of an onus to create real differentiation to create real um you know value proposition whatever you're selling whatever you're marketing the idea that um for many people the thing that they previously bought from you service product whatever um quite suddenly becomes a luxury item for them this idea that um if they were used to investing x amount of money in their marketing and design services um you know after they experience something as really as staggering as um what the world has gone through um those decisions about where we're investing our money are by you know just by necessity going to be different and the things that were a bit more automatic like yeah we're going to put x amount of our budget into this product this service this whatever is going to look at a lot of the things that they used to spend money on and say well is that something i really need or has that become a luxury and i think then that becomes a marketing challenge to say well how do i sell that same thing that was a bit more automatic before or at least a little bit more understood or planned for before how do i sell that now and really extol the benefits of it extol the real value and benefits of it so to create a priority for your customers say yeah do that still even despite you know some of the challenges i'm facing i'm still investing in welcome back to the healthy business podcast before we get into our interview with Brian Gruner i do want to uh do some cleanup once again after a fireside chat i was talking about a can of beans and unfortunately uh what i discovered were my right leaning friends complimented me on the topic and my left leaning friends did not compliment me or made comments regarding the $600 in fact i received more unsubscribes than i ever have had uh after an episode and it's in relation to the $600 because i made the statement that uh, many employers are struggling with hiring right now because uh, people who are unemployed are making more money staying unemployed with that additional $600 than they would if they went back to work. Um, that is a fact. I have seen it enough with many of my clients to know that is a fact. Now, I did some more research on it and uh, I, I like what Andrew Yang said about it. He's a big fan of UBI. Uh, he agreed that the $600 is preventing people from coming back to work. He suggested that what you do is uh, you give them some form of that uh, supplement, that, that uh, additional subsidy after they take a job. So they uh, take a job, minimum wage, then they receive an additional $400 or $600. I think that's smart. And I think that's the right thing to do. The other thing that was an issue is that there was some debate over how I was uh, saying divisive. Is it divisive or is it divisive? I looked into it and I saw that it was uh, said both ways. In fact, I, I, uh, I discovered that President, President Obama would say divisive. Uh, other people would say divisive. It didn't seem like there was any kind of uh, uh, rhyme nor reason to it. And, um, and I guess I just, uh, <laughs> I had no idea that divisive, the word divisive could be such a divisive topic, but apparently it is. Next up, we have Brian Gruner, six time nominee, one time winner, Grammy award winner. Brian Gruner, the owner of White Bicycle. And in this interview, he talks about uh, branding strategy, branding design, branding content, how to brand during the COVID-19 crisis and how it's more important than ever. And another thing that he shares with us is his latest album that he's working on 
that he just finished up during the uh, quarantine that I believe will be the seventh Grammy nomination and hopefully the second Grammy win. So uh, I'm very excited for you to hear more from Brian. Next up, Brian Gruner, Grammy winner, owner of White Bicycle. Yeah, let me just do a little tiny... There you go. I'm nice. still cutting my own hair, man. That's uh, wow. that's good. That's, I'm glad to I'm glad to be of service there. <laughs> well, you know what? You did a good job with the haircut. I did my best. So, are you are you when you're cutting your hair? What are you doing? You you looking in the mirror? What do you what do you got going yeah. on? Yeah, I'm doing a uh, I'm doing a fairly involved mirror to mirror, and I'm able to get basically I'm able to do this. The lower the lower 35 pretty good this part up here i'm just basically is that's like when people go for kind of the uh uncultivated look on their front yard just let yeah. it sort of overgrow that's me front yard backyard i've been you know ma- maintaining front yard i've been just letting go back for a while are you uh are you gonna go back to a barber soon or what, what's are, are any of us gonna go back to anything <laughs> <laughs> maybe I have no idea. I, uh, I honestly haven't even, to this point, yeah, I'm going to try one more thing. To this point, I haven't even uh, tried to find out if those people are open. You know what I mean? Like, I just haven't paid attention. Um, like, maybe they're open. I have no idea. Um, like everybody, I thought maybe I should invest in a in a haircutting truck that just shows up at people's houses. I can't cut hair, but I would totally put my money into that. Um, I think that's what the world needs. There you hair go. Cutting. That's become quite popular as I understand it. The COVID yeah. friendly. Yeah, the, the truck shows up and the kids run out and the <laughs> mom buys six haircuts and they all get shorn and then sent back into the house, I guess. Maybe have some kind of uh, Mr. Softy music going too. Yeah, what would the music be? I guess it would be kind of like exclusively Brian Adams. It would be some bad like 1987 <laughs> Brian Adams cut that you thought, you know, was frozen in time, but actually still exists uh, for some inexplicable reason. But yeah, That's like a knife, right? Yeah, absolutely. Summer of '69, probably like the acoustic version of Summer of '69. I love it. I love it. Yeah. All the all the Gen Xers will come running. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Everyone will be like, oh man, I haven't heard that Corey Hart hit in a long time in a long time. I still wear my sunglasses at night because of this song. Yeah. Uh, I love it. They'll, I love they'll show it. up. Hey, did you know, first of all, I, I want you to know that I've already been recording. Oh good. Um, but did you know I was taking a look, uh, doing a little research and I have 87 episodes, and uh, you're number two, two most, second most listened to episode. How about that? Is it just by volume? Because I seem to recall that that particular episode being four and a half hours long. It was longer, <laughs> it was longer than any installment of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. So maybe it's just the most viewing time and not actually the most views. Uh, that maybe that that would explain. I don't think so. No, I think it was uh, the most listened to, second most listened to, which uh, you refer to in the business as the white bicycle bump. That's what you got. The white bicycle <laughs> bump. I love it. I, I you know, I, I think it might have to do too with uh, with you being a Grammy winner. People want to listen. You 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 uh, are a Grammy winner. Six a, time Grammy nominee. That could be it. It could be the allure of you know the whiff of fame. That, that just has pulled people into that riveting story. Um, but I, I will say, I'd be remiss to say that I'm not grateful for being included. And um, the You're the Expert Now bump, our business probably went up at least a percent in the immediate <laughs> aftermath. All those wow. viewers have turned into customers, man. They're all <laughs> customers now. Thousands yeah, of thousands customers. Thousands Congratulations, of customers. man. Thank that's you. that's oh, great to hear. You. The, the you're the expert now bump. No, I mean, I think it was, uh, as you know, there's, I've had reason to peruse that. We covered so many great topics and it has been uh, really exciting and, you know, I guess affirming in the best possible way to see a lot of the uh, COVID and pandemic related 
topics start to bubble bubble over the wall. Um, that's been uh, um, it's good. Are you enjoying doing it? Has it been? Has it remained fun to be the uh, the host of your own show? It's been enjoyable. It, it's it's helped me through uh, the quarantine time to keep me sane. Um, yeah. it, it has been enjoyable, and uh, you know it's it's helping people get get uh, get the word out about what they're doing, how they're surviving. Yeah. And I'm getting, you know, I'm getting a lot of email, a lot of texts, things like that, a lot of thank yous for uh, uh, what I'm sharing here. So I, I know, I know people are are listening, and it matters. Yeah, congrats on all that. Um, you know, Brian, one of the reasons why I brought you on was uh, just to kind of get an idea of of uh, how, with all the noise that's going on out there, um, how do you market? How does how does a how does a business market in this environment? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, I appreciate that question, not only because I would imagine that anybody who's selling a product or a service has anything to market feels the pressure of the moment to, you know, really make sure you're um, putting yourselves out there. Everybody's feeling the impacts of what's going on economically, what's going on in the world. Uh, and the priority shifts that inevitably come with it. So I would imagine everybody's feeling a lot of pressure and it's not a stretch for me to imagine that because, you know, White Bicycle has been no different in that. Um, we have felt a tremendous amount of pressure and maybe in some respects uh, for the first time, uh, the intensity of, of needing to market ourselves to really figure out mm. a way to, uh, you know, to seize this moment. Um, you know, we've subsisted pretty well off of referral um, for our entire existence. Um, and, you know, I think we've, uh, we also weathered the recession. I mean, as a 15 year old company, we weathered the recession in, I guess we would have felt it here most in like 08, 09. Um, we sort of worked our way through that and, um, you know, have subsisted all off of referrals and that this is just doesn't seem enough anymore. You know, right, what, we, right. what we did in the past just doesn't seem enough. I would imagine most business owners who are marketing on any level feel that pressure. The way we used to do it is clearly not the way we need to be doing it now. And, and, and that's what I'm seeing too, Brian, is that uh, a lot of customers were just uh, waiting for the call, you know, and the call yeah. would come in and, and that's how business. Yeah. Went. Yeah. And, and then all of a sudden with this coronavirus, those calls aren't coming in the way they, they used to. Sure. And, and now a lot of business owners don't really know what to do. Right. And I think, I mean, so to, to get after the, the actual question, I, I think that one misnomer would be to think that this is a time that calls for all new, you know, approaches and all new, you know, uh, you know, marketing techniques or marketing strategies. Um, I think tried and true is still, is still tried and true. I think there's more of an onus to create real differentiation, to create real, um, you know, value proposition. Whatever you're selling, whatever you're marketing, um, whether it is services or whether it's products, whether it's a retail experience, etc. Um, I think that the idea that um, you know, uh, the idea that um, for many people, the thing that they previously bought from you, service, product, whatever, um, quite suddenly becomes a luxury item for them. This idea that um, if they were used to investing X amount of money in their marketing and design services, um, you know, after they experience something as really as staggering as um, what the world has gone through, um, those decisions about where we're investing our money are by, you know, just by necessity going to different and the things that were a bit more automatic like yeah we're gonna put x amount of our budget into this product this service this whatever um and i think same on retail somebody who's balancing their home budget is going to look at a lot of the things that they used to spend money on and say well is that something i really need or has that become a luxury and i think then that becomes a marketing challenge to say well how do i sell that same thing that was a bit more automatic before or at least a little bit more understood or planned for before. How do I sell that now and really extol the benefits of it, extol the real value and benefits of it to, to create a 
priority for your customer to say, yeah, I can do that still, even despite you know some of the challenges I'm facing, I'm gonna still invest in that. How do you answer that question? Um, I think that you know, uh, regardless of whether you are uh, marketing in a recession or in a downturn or a crisis like this, or whether you're marketing in boom times, um, you're going to be more effective regardless of circumstances if you have a real clear understanding of what you are delivering, not in terms of product or service, but in terms of really benefit to the audience. So now I think more than ever, having a crystalline sense of you know not only what you're selling and the, the advantages benefits um, you know not just competitively um, but really the advantages for that person that you know business that you know um, ultimate consumer what do I get out of it matters way more under the circumstances so the answers are not entirely new there's just a, I think a a somewhat renewed sense of urgency around getting some of those, you know, points of difference really, really right. Um, and I do think that there are, you know, ways to meet your audience better than halfway in that equation as well. Um, uh, a, an ounce of empathy goes an awful long way. What's this person going through? It used to be, you know, um, or I think in, in, we'll call it in peace times, it was enough to say, hey, what problem is this solving for, you know, my, you know, my customer, um, everybody sort of has that sales tru truism in their, in their head. Um, I think that now it's, hey, what are the additional barriers that my customer's going through? You know, what are the additional things that they're contending with now that makes this not as automatic a, an investment or a purchase for them? Um, so really, I think look at those. Um, something that we've been doing at White Bicycle with our clients and again for ourselves, um, we've been advancing. There's no trademark on this. We just call it a doubt board because a doubt uh, board, you a, said? Doubt, a doubt board. So basically a big board of the doubts that are going to be in our customers' minds, whether they're ours or our clients, um, that are going to be unique to this moment um, to start to be a little bit, uh, you know, prognosticating, if you will, to think forward and think, well, what's going to be the barrier to returning? So imagine you were working, say, with a, uh, you know, with a, you know, museum, and they're going to be coming back online and welcoming you know, people back to the uh, to the physical space for the first time. What are the doubts that those audiences are going to be bringing with them? Mm -hmm. What are the things that are going to be unique to the moment, whether they're related to the health crisis, whether they're related to, you know, just the way they spend their time, whether it's something related to membership or whether it's something related to just, you know, the mood for the moment. Um, understanding, you know, and, and some of those doubts, um, in the same way that you might look at, a SWOT analysis and say, hey, you know what, on the opportunity side, um, you know, or I should say on the other side of every opportunity is a threat. On the, on the other side of every doubt is, I think, you know, a certainty, a way to say, oh, you know what, somebody needs your art more than ever now. How do you make sure that they get that you get that? Um, so I think when we have looked at um, some things to do, really putting not just your brand under the, you know, microscope in this moment, um, but also putting the identity of the audience of it under the microscope and trying to understand, you know, what are the things that are going to be barriers for them, you know, to engage again and, and you know, addressing those things through marketing, to have marketing really speaking directly uh, to some of those new gaps that have opened up for whatever combination of reasons. So when you, when you assess the doubts, are you then taking those doubts and then creating some kind of a, a marketing plan around that? Yeah, I think that becomes pretty, I mean, at that point it becomes conventional and I don't mean conventional to say, you know, limited to a certain number of usuals, um, but it's the same approach to planning marketing. It should be driven by budget. It should be driven by a sense of the return you're going to get um, and a clear sense of, of what outcomes are, are anticipated. I would go ahead and say to um, a general rule of thumb uh, is, uh, you know, to do less better. Um, so to really understand where your sweet spots are, again, I think the sense of urgency might create an appetite for a lot of frenetic activity to do a lot. Um, you're just adding more noise and sort of probably diluting message. Um, so yeah, I think that again, um, the, the, sh the size and shape of a, of a plan would depend 
you know, quite variably on what you're selling and who you're selling it to and, you know, what your, you know, sort of channels are for selling it. Um, but the plan would be, you know, pointed around those principles for sure. Uh, same as it ever was. What are we going to get out of this investment? So, yeah. And, and what, what's the best way for uh, a, a small business to cut through all the noise? Because I, you know, right now, especially during the quarantine, everybody was on social media and putting stuff out there, um, video, uh, audio, you name it. And there's just a lot of noise. Um, how does a business cut through that noise to get the most effective marketing campaign? And uh, is there a particular social media or other site that they should do it on? Um, I think that's two parts. You know, that's two, two, I hear two questions in there, Tony. You know, one is about, uh, I think, uh, the message, the urgency, the clarity, and the type of message being delivered, and the other is about the vehicle that those are being, you know, delivered through. You know, the idea that uh, kind of a, a benefit-driven cell is always going to be more effective is even more important in the in, um, amongst the noise uh, in a noisy environment. Um, I think it's uh, you know an example that I always like to use is. Uh, that sort of psycho psychological premise that people uh, recognize the sound of their own name more than any other sound in the you know in the English language that it's almost like a you know instantaneous reaction. I think the same is true of uh, you know a business or a consumer need. You know what you need in a in, in a very urgent way. So if you're putting out messaging, you want to bust you know bust through the clutter. Um, make sure you're premising that message on something that is going to resonantly solve somebody's need to cure somebody's pain. Um, it's not a, it's not at all an opportunity to be extolling, you know, the features of product or the features of service, but really the benefit. And that's, I think that's universally true, but I think that's the most effective way to break through. I don't think there's tricks that are going to work in a particular way to mm. package a message. I think same as it ever was. You know, uh, that's where creative messaging, that's where working with a, uh, you know, with a, you know, somebody who, you know, can design for those spaces is helpful. But if you don't have those resources, don't forget the number one thing is make sure you're advancing something that's already inherently important to the audience you're trying to reach. On the vehicle side of it, I think that, you know, that understanding where people are spending their attention right now, I think that this has certainly been i mean a few things what we're doing today right now um i noticed at some point along the way you went from audio podcast to you know video podcast this idea that um overnight you know i think you know the entire communications world shifted quite you know quite effortlessly to an embrace of video on a level that they you know had never before um you know i think that it's just almost ubiquitous now and and it was really kind of exciting to watch uh, and you know exciting to watch as you were actively participating in content so developing content rich the kind of things where patiently you can you know start to have a conversation or really start to delve into you know some of those things i think now is an awesome time for brands especially service brands to be, you know, embracing that content, uh, you know, that content schedule to put forward content that really more patiently, um, you know, attracts people, uh, you know, to uh, hearing some of what they have to offer, ways that they can partner, ways that they can you know, deliver benefit. But you got to get somebody to watch it, right? So yeah. the idea of using social media, uh, email, using some of those, I, I'm mentioning digital platforms because they don't come with some of the same you know, uh, overhead costs that you know, traditional media might. Um, this seems to be, and I don't think I'm saying anything revelationary here. I think it's a great time for people to be investing and to really be looking at some of those direct dial mediums, whether it is social media as a way to drive traffic to website, email as a way to keep people informed about content marketing that you're putting forward. Um, those kinds of things that allow a more patient cumulative dialogue around ways that you can be a differentiator. If you're in the product space, I feel that's a little bit different. Um, I do think that, you know, if you are a restaurant trying to, you know, drive traffic or whether you're, you know, um, a retail product 
provided that you're not sitting behind some COVID barrier that you haven't been able to fully mobilize yet. Um, if you're mobilized, I think the idea of, you know, again, um, differentiating, figuring out why us, why now, um, how do we particularly get this well? I, I think that answers the question. Yeah, I think sure, there is, sure. I think there is a, a lot of tried and true in that, Tony. I think it is being much more, uh, I think, aware and surgical in the way you're prescribing some things you knew already. Um, yeah, sure. And then, you know, you mentioned the content. Um, you know, we hear that a lot now where uh, it's important to to create content. What, what advice do you give? Because the only way you can have good content, any company, is if the people that truly understand the business are creating the content. And I know that's a struggle for a lot of business owners. What, what kind of advice do you give business owners to help them, encourage them to actually create content and then to do it consistently? Right. I mean, I think the idea that uh, once you get over this sort of sense of obligation, this we need to be doing that. And that has happened, I believe, from my experience, having been in the communications world uh, for my entire career and having seen the advent of email, the advent of, you know, websites as driving retail, the advent of social media becoming part of, you know, that equation. Um, there's a tremendous amount of pressure on the brand that you have to participate in space. We've got to do this. I think in some respects, you know, just transcending that alone is a big part of it. Just doing anything because you've got to almost always leads to, I think, sub you know suboptimal yeah. results right right um, it really needs to be an expression of enthusiasm for the brand and i think i would give broader brand advice first um, and this is across the full spectrum of all communications what you're doing with branding in a sort of buzzword way you're basically just trying to create more surface area for your brand and you would normally think hey that's more you know, that just gives us a larger footprint or a larger impression. But I think the way it really works, uh, you know, just if you want to extend the metaphor, is by creating more surface area, you're creating more surface where your customer can catch their reflection in your brand, mm -hmm. where they can see themselves in your brand and say, yeah, man, I look good. I'm a, I'm a you're the expert now guy. I watch that thing. I like the way he thinks. I like the way the people he brings on thinks. That's not a reflection on your brand. That's a reflection on the audience's brand. They're the one saying, oh, yeah, I'm a you're the expert now guy because of what they have put out there. That's why I think it is so dramatic in the, you know, in the service promotion area, because that's what you're really doing is you're giving somebody a glimpse into what's it like to be in a really productive working relationship with these guys. What's it like to partner with these, these folks? Where are their priorities and how does my personal brand, my business brand align with their brand and their personal brand. What's the relationship going to be like and what's the synergy going to be between the businesses? I think, you know, I think that that is a very broad way of looking at it. You know, yeah. Yeah, that's just more ways in. It's more ways for somebody to really understand what you're doing. How, how does White Bicycle do it that, to make, you know, potential customers feel that way about hiring White Bicycle? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I've already <laughs> admitted rather openly that White Bicycle has subsisted on the referral basis. So like any service business, our first priority is to through every touch point, through every engagement, to try to deliver high value, to try to reflect the priorities of the customer, to make sure that we are attuned to that. That has been the, to me, the secret ingredient to go, that's not about going above and beyond. It's about intuiting and understanding and really um, uh, sort of, uh, I think, uh, reaching, uh, meeting somebody better than halfway as it relates to understanding what their brand needs to be successful. Um, that has led to some pretty, I think, energized referrals uh, historically for us. That has been the way our business has grown. I think right now, what it, you know, we're going to be 15 at the end of the year. So I think that we look at it opportunistically and say, well, you know, we have 15 years of content that we haven't really, you know, shaped for folks. And so what we've done, in a, it, it, and I think if I took a step back and say, hey, how, how do we do it? I can probably say, well, 
it's more like how are we doing it now um we're like every other every other business um i've joked in the i think in the in the most dark dark darkly humorous way that uh this pandemic was in many respects from a business standpoint uh something we foolishly wished for without knowing it um end of last year we were exceedingly busy you know to a person across the board and i think you know uh kyle business partner my business partner kyle and i kind of looked at each other and said hey you know what we could use is a couple of slow months just to really take ourselves on as a client mm. and get to some of those things that we have struggled to get to um the things that we saw as you know an opportunity for us to grow in new directions um this was not what we had envisioned but <laughs> we i think like everybody else um you know i was relating it to uh you know home projects the same way that a lot of folks have looked at you know the pandemic and said hey i want to get to the bathroom and i want to get to the you know the kitchen and we're going to you know replace the floor i think brands have had the same opportunities um we've taken the opportunity to really set some some groundwork I think that the impulse in a crisis like this, you know, and I'm not saying a crisis for us as much as I am just this global thing that we are all participating in. Um, you know, is to really try to solve things in the short term. Um, but I think that we've looked at it and said, "Hey, how can we use this as an opportunity to prepare ourselves uh for a second version, to do the things, you know, to take on those renovation projects if you will." um that are going to help suit us better uh for a post crisis but you know perhaps a recessed economy to be much more uh you know competitive on the other side of the crisis um you know during a period when it's going to be maybe even you know more more subtly competitive so things like uh you know really looking at our own brand and really clearly at that as a platform for messaging how are we unique from our competition you know to also look at our own internal sales mechanism and to to democratize that we're a team of 7 so to say how are we going to you know deputize everybody to be participating in the sales culture that we created here and put more emphasis on sales throughout a process um whether it's within a project or even just within our own you know sort of circles of influence um yeah. things like that tony have been pre- preparation for what comes next and content has been a part of that as well and mm-hmm. um, we've looked at what is this the sort of pent up evidence that we haven't shared with folks you know whether it's something in the you know music space like the grammy stuff that you love to <laughs> to bring up on a regular basis um you know uh, you know but what does that mean to you know sort of a business to business client to really be able to take that content and not just celebrate the coolness of it in the abstract but to really look at it and say Yeah, what is it about that success that strategically would give faith to somebody who's in a totally different category um but wants to be a white bicycle believer? How, how you know one of the things that typically gets cut first is in marketing and and things like that. How do you convince them that marketing is more important than ever right now? Um uh, well, I mean, I think that fundamentally i mean a, a belief that we have is that marketing communications um are is not a vertical uh it's not something that runs parallel to sales uh, i think a misunderstanding of the way marketing works is to look at it and say well we have a marketing department you know and that's one of the verticals within our business it might be sales and it might be production it might be product it might be you know uh team development or you know internal you know internal uh human relations and things like that um but really we look at marketing and communications as a horizontal it runs through all of those other things it is a tool uh to i think uh be wielded by sales uh to be wielded by you know brand development and relation to relationship development so to me the philosophical answer to that question is well if sales isn't important now then marketing must not be important now so if you're going to cut back on marketing you're essentially saying hey we're going to cut back on the tools that we uh need to provide to sales uh at this critical point where sales is more important than ever that just seems to be uh a fundamental misunderstanding 
Your sales is critically important right now. So having a great sales plan is important. And a great part of a great sales plan would be, what are the tools that marketing needs to deliver to these frontline salespeople? Whatever type of business you're running in, whatever type of tools you deem would be, I guess, most surgically effective in reaching people. So I would answer it not by defending marketing, but by really pointing out how marketing is feeding everything from you know, brand experience, to employee satisfaction, to, you know, to ultimately uh, effective sales. Um, it's part of everything. So I think it makes sense to reprioritize. You know, maybe we're not, you know, maybe this was more the point of your question. We're gonna be cutting back on advertising. You know, we're gonna be cutting back on paid impressions and trying to earn those impressions more. That I could get behind entirely. And I think that just is a brand to brand, you know, question of what, ultimately is going to, you know, to drive some things, you right, know, right. there might be a business out there for whom now is the perfect time to advertise because there's less noise, there's less competition. And there might be another where it's like, you know, no one's, no one's looking to that, you know, medium for sort of a general brand awareness. So why don't you get into more of a relationship driving um, medium like social media or email, etc. So I think I think that's the way of looking at it, Tony. And I think that it's it's a it's a basic understanding too of how marketing serves other things, and it isn't it isn't a thing. It's not a department unto itself. Thank you. Uh, with the success you've had, um, winning the Grammy and and being nominated, how do you take what you've done there, what you've learned there? And, and blend it into the everyday marketing that you're doing? Um, I, just to clarify, the marketing that we're doing for our clients or the marketing of White Bicycle? The marketing you're doing for your clients. Yeah, I mean, I think that the first, the, the base premise of that is that uh, the work we do in the music business has always been a passion play. Our business has grown uh, to attract designers and you know writers who really you know have a a passion for um reflecting art and culture and that's not just in the music business it's it's what we've done you know with uh you know the virtual penny art center and the museum work in the museum space it's what we've done with a lot of you know experience driven brands whether those are you know restaurants or or you know um you know, any kind of destination um so i i look at that stuff and think First and foremost, that stuff is really a, a specialty. It's a niche of ours. And there is something about trying to take the, you know, the intangible truths of something like music and uh, understand it in a way where we can convey it back in a package that where it feels like a reflection of the brand. So when I look at, at what we're doing there, I think, well, some of that is just really understanding why that musician or that album uh, is important to that person who went out and bought it, uh, traveled 500 miles to go to the rock show, um, you know, uh, tattoos the name of the artist on their, on their arm. You're talking about brand loyalty on a level that's really hard to compare to any other category. Um, when you talk about, you know, what I was saying before about the identity being completed by the brand that you are engaging, I don't think it's any purer than in music. Like if you have a long enough conversation with anybody who has an even passing interest in music, um, before too long, as they describe themselves, they're going to get to the genre of music they like and the bands they like. And if you talk a little longer, you're going to hear about experiences where, you know, that record or that song became soundtrack to what they were doing and, you know, sort of fostered relationships with that artist or otherwise it's important for me to sort of paint that picture um, because I do look at the relationship that people have with stuff like music or stuff like art, um, stuff like, you know, their favorite books or their favorite TV shows, etc., and think that those relationships offer one of the most poignant distilled notions of how brands work on people um, that I think we've succeeded in that sort of, really fun, luxurious, cool, awesome space is exactly what we try to bring over to, you know, our other clients. How can we foster those kinds of affinities with a law firm or with an architect or with a, an art museum? How can we, you know, understand what it is that makes somebody tick 
in the, you know, in the professional services realm. Now it never works and nobody, you know, nobody goes around with the jean jacket with their law firms, you know, patch on the back of it. <laughs> it's not quite one-to-one, -one, but what you're asking somebody to do anytime that they have a loyal brand relationship with you is to believe what you believe and, you know, to say, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a that guy, you know, I'm not me if I don't work with law firm X, I'm not me if I don't work with those guys. And that's what I think we brought to all of our other work. Um, through those lessons. When I think about, you know, what we've learned in the music space um, from those successes is it's understanding how to reach people in ways that are most important to them. And that's just applicable to any category. Um, mm -hmm. Get somebody to passionately believe in the brands that they're working with and to think, yeah, these guys, you know, kind of complete me, you know, just put the brand. I'm not me if I'm not getting my business advice from Tony DeSimone. Uh, and it's really not about you. Um, I think it's about the selfish motivation of, of you know, selfless engagement. With, with your uh, experience, with, with all the uh, work that you've done with uh, the music, have you ever considered uh, getting back in there and uh, working with uh, uh, more, more groups? Yeah, that's, that's an under the radar thing for us. You know, I would say annu annually from a, revenue percentage standpoint, you know, it can't be more than, you know, five or 10% of our, of our total activity. Mm -hmm. um, that does not mean it's not some of the coolest projects that we do on an annual basis. Um, we have grown a business and I think the answer to your previous question was, uh, you know, a little bit incomplete. I was really looking out at what we've learned about communications, uh, you know, through the, the work that we've done uh, in the music space. I think there's another thing is we've grown a team around the concept of white bicycle, you know, that's really diverse, you know, in, in terms of skill sets. And you know, some of those, some of our team have really have done a lot in the music space. Some have done very little in the music space. Um, I think that some of those sensibilities have carried over, but I think it's always been important, you know, to the core white bicyclist when it was just me or when it was me and Kyle, or now that it's, you know, seven people, is that we are really looking not at defining what we do based on the category that we're working in, but rather based on that connection between brand and audience. Uh, and that sort of transcends category. And it frankly is not possible without the team of professionals that's around me as well. Like I just, I have, I have a band of that that I'm particularly, no pun intended, a band of that that I think I, is my sort of my wheelhouse. But I think collectively we've become, you know, some greater than the parts that are able to do that. Um, as far as, you know, that percentage of revenue and what we're still doing, we've chosen, I think, to take on projects where we can really spend the, the they, they, in some respects, have become more pet projects. Again, they, you know, maybe margin a little bit more poorly than other things. Um, but there are areas where we really feel like we can, you know, delve into the music and have done some things, you know, some really fun things, um, both in the jazz and in the indie rock, indie rock world. You know, I think we've done a couple things during, you know, the COVID period that have been super, you know, super exciting. And, you know, um, you know, so that's continued on a regular basis. Uh, we have, you know, we are, um, you know, always looking for those opportunities that might be sort of bold enough or broad enough to get us back into, you know, Grammy contention or something like that, but mm -hmm. more often than not, and I think that business has changed so much more often than not, we're trying to find a project that really, you know, calls or sort of draws upon our ability to connect in, in meaningful ways, you know, and I think, uh, uh, for instance, um, we just completed a project um, with a music label called ORG, um, but the project is uh, the first proper record for an artist by the name of Jimmy Sweeney. And Jimmy Sweeney was one of these almost infamously lost voices in, in rock history. Um, he was a uh, you know, young black artist um, that was part of the Sun Records or Sun Recording Studios um, stable of artists back in the 50s. Um, pre, you know, he predated Elvis Presley by you know, months or a year. Mm -hmm. um, and he recorded some demos for Sun that 
became almost the template for Elvis Presley's career. No he was overlooked because of race. He was overlooked because of, you know, the marketability of him as an artist. Um, but quite famously, he wrote the song uh, called Without You. And that was the, you know, that the executives at Sun gave that record to Elvis and said, we want you to record this song. We want you to sound like this. And quite famously, Elvis tried and failed to capture what this guy, Jimmy Sweeney, had captured on record. Um, and, you know, it's a great story. The, the other side of it is uh, this kind of like a 90s punk rock guy. I've gotten to know this guy, Christopher Kennedy. He discovered uh, Jimmy Sweeney through just flipping through the record bins at, uh, you know, at, while he was touring as a, as a musician and loved that genre and became a real Jimmy Sweeney kind of aficionado. He, you know, was collecting all of these, you know, seven inches that he had put out historically. And independent from that, heard the story of this lost acetate, this unknown record. Who is this, who's the guy who sings without you? Uh, and because of his enthusiasm for the genre, he said, oh, I'm gonna try and listen to that. I wanna hear this record found out who possessed this one-off only copy of this record, uh, you know, and, you know, uh, arranged to listen to it. And the minute he heard his voice, the very minute he heard his voice, he said, I know who that is. That's Jimmy Sweeney. Okay. And he solved the, he solved the mystery of who this, you know, mystery influence on Elvis Presley was, wrote an article about it. One thing leads to another. They record this, you know, record this. They had zero budget to do a, you know, record packaging project. But when I heard part of that story, it was one of those things where I'm like, well, white bike, we have to do this. We have to be involved with this. So that was one of the things that we did right around the turn of the year that actually was supposed to come out on record store day during COVID and got upset because that event was canceled. Finally going to get its, its proper release in a couple of weeks. Well, um, so exciting. it's not like a new project for us. I know you can hear the, the, the nuance of that stuff. Um, you know, those are big stories. When I think about content, those are stories that we have undershared with our audiences. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, but I think that they also are the premise of the type of work we're doing in the music business. And I'd like to think what we're bringing from the music business into pretty much every engagement is what's the, what's the kernel of interest in that story? What's the real germ of that, you know, that story? And how can we help tell it? I think the other part of it is how can we do that creatively? I mean, that's, that for us is table stakes. You know, how do we, you know, how do we actually, you know, make this look good and make it sound good? Um, that's what we ought to do well, just because we sell that service. Uh, so we might, I might undersell that a little bit, but yeah, you know, yeah, I, I think design, you do. we try to design, design it well, and we try to write well and, you know, um, express the brand in a meaningful way, but it all starts with being able to understand how that brand connects. This is the uh, yeah. album. This is the aforementioned Jimmy Sweeney record. Um, you know, it's such a privilege. This is actually his first proper LP. Um, and his uh, one living uh, uh, daughter, uh, I think, really helped to cinch that all together. Um, I don't have it opened, but, you know, this is all of the, all of the music that he had recorded uh, over the course of his career, never put out in a, you know, in a proper LP. So, you know, just a really amazing. And it says here, you know, rock and roll's greatest mystery voice has finally, uh, finally has a name. Um, so it, it was, uh, you know, it's projects like these where you get to say, what would the Jimmy Sweeney record that could have come out, you know, uh, 50 years ago, or now I guess maybe more like, uh, you know, 60 years ago, um, you know, what would that have looked like? What would it have felt like? What would have been the priority? So yeah, things like this um, are, I think templates are not templates, but sort of examples of um, the bigger picture and certainly yeah. what we're doing in the, in the music space. That's great news. And make sure uh, you send me a link or can, can we just get that on Amazon if we wanted to, or how do you uh, get Yeah, it? that's a record store day. And I think it's the August 20th record store day. Okay. Um, they've taken one, one day and turned it into three days. Um, whichever day the August 20th um, release schedule is, it'll be in record stores that day, but I will send you a link to it. And I think once it is officially released, there will likely be some really interesting stories about, you know, um, how this sort of changes the, the complexion of, of the way people understand that unique combination of gospel and country that became, 
you know, an Elvis Presley type of rock and roll. Um, Very cool. That's, uh, that's really the roots in many respects. Grammy winning marketing with uh, White Bicycle. You know, Brian, if, if people want to uh, learn more about you or uh, White Bicycle, where, where do they go? Uh, the website gives you a current remedial uh, understanding of all that. Uh, that is something that, you know, I think, you know, I, I would say uh, the forced evolution that White Bike has embraced through this is, you know, really embracing the need for us to do more in the content space and to put some things forward in that way. Um, so I think that in the normal places uh, that you would anticipate to learn about uh, a brand, uh, but I think the best way would be, you know, for now would be, again, if it's to explore working relationships, uh, you know, a Zoom conversation like this is really great. So, you know, reaching out to us would be a great, uh, you know, would be a great way to, you know, to be more specific about ways we might be able to be, uh, you know, collaboratively successful. Well, I'll make sure that I have the links in the uh, show notes and um, uh, we're Please. nearing, we're nearing the end here, but, but Brian, uh, let the first time we uh, went and had an interview, uh, you had shared a story after I packed everything away about weird Al Yankovic yeah. and your, your interesting connection with him. Um, are you interested in sharing that story? Cause I know people would love to hear this. I'll tell you what, because you have <laughs> violated the terms of my rider and put me on the spot, but done so right after you had given me an opportunity to plug my own business. I will half comply and I will say the Weird Al story is personal and it is about orbits aligning in unexpected places and in unexpected ways multiple times um, with pure hilarity. But then I will also say because our website doesn't tell that story, because our website doesn't do a good job of telling story, anybody who wants to hear that story should reach out and we should start an engagement. I'll tell the the full story to anybody who would like to have a really great conversation about marketing, about coincidence and about, you know, the need of taking care of business before, uh, you know, before you get on an airplane. <laughs> uh, that's that's fair all I'm going to say. That's, that's fair that's, enough, that's, Brian. That's protecting the innocent. That is, you know, protecting <laughs> those who I know who have personal relationships with, you know, with the, all people involved. Yes. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's, that's as much as I will, that's as much as I will say. And I Fair only enough. wish I want I would not let you put your microphone away without saying thanks. I love the conversations. Obviously I, I love talking about brand, but I also like, you know, um, what you do and hopefully delivering some value to folks, um, you know, who are on your side. I'm not trying to sneak last word in, um, you know, the thing, one of the things that has haunted me you know, I think in a good way, in a motivating way. And I, I wish I could attribute the quote. Um, I'm not sure it's sage or some really unique quote. Something I read in somebody's, you know, feed along, along this COVID stretch. And it's a simple premise. Uh, when an opportunity arises, it's too late to prepare. And I think that so much of what we're talking about in the marketing and, and you know, the sort of communications world um, is so much easier if you're prepared to, you know, to... Uh, really shine a light on the benefits that you deliver to folks through whatever it is you're selling. That the preparation is always a good idea to stay ever prepared to understand where you fit. Um, that's something that we're experiencing. I mean, the, the lame-ass answers to how can people find out more about White Bicycle is, a, is, I think, an indication that we were not prepared for a moment where we could have turned on some content, um, you know, and um, but instead of worrying about that, we just took the moment and said, let's do that preparation now. Let's not have that be a, you know, a circumstance moving forward and to really, you know, again, uh, look at some of those preparations. So that's a bit of, you know, inspiration that I took from the moment and have been reminding, you know, myself and for my part in, in things, reminding our team. And so I share that through you, you know, the same thing. It's, it's the perfect time to be, pre be preparing for the opportunities that will no doubt come when the world starts to, to turn in a slightly more normal direction and pace. Excellent. That's a great place to stop. Brian Gruner, owner of White Bicycle. Thank you so much for coming on again. Tony, uh, owner of You're the Expert Now. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> My pleasure. Yeah. Take right. care. Talk soon.